State Route 206 Stone Arch Bridge in, over the Stony Brook in Princeton, Mercer County, New Jersey, is the oldest continuously functioning bridge in the state. This trip arch bridge was originally built in 1792 and by 2016 required rehabilitation. Despite modification, much of the original bridge's fabric was preserved intact as a result of a bridge widening effort in 1916. Here, we discuss the documentation of a nearly complete 18th century bridge, termed here as a legacy structure, and cons within later bridge additions. Legacy structures or infrastructure features preserved by later additions or replacement structures have the potential to retain engineering and design information from the past. In this case, intact structural elements below the present bridge deck revealed a distinct engineering style used in the 18th century England that was transferred to New Jersey by federal period bridge builders and possibly elsewhere. Richard Grubb and Associates involvement in the bridge project began in 2016 after a partial parapet collapse. The bridge is located within several national register listed properties. Dynamic cultural resources constraints were in place and early conversations were needed with the historic preservation community to ensure preservation concerns were addressed. Some of these aspects included hair documentation and archeological monitoring. Replacement of an adjacent 1896 floodplain bridge, which you can see here at the top, and the stabilization of the 1714 Worst Mill ruins at the bottom of the screen were also necessary. Archaeological monitoring of infrastructure projects, particularly bridge, road, and dam projects, often reveal evidence of much earlier legacy structures that offer opportunities uh, to document design techniques from the past. Identification of several prior legacy structure examples in New Jersey highlight the hidden complexity of such archaeological features and the insights they provide regarding historic technologies. Among these is the Liddell Pond Dam removal project in Mendham Township, Morris County, New Jersey, adjacent to 18th century mill ruins. Removal of a 20th century concrete dam exposed well-preserved remains of a wooden cribbing legacy dam on the upstream side of the modern dam. And here in this slide, you can see those as blue, orange, and, um, uh, and green um, uh, features on this, on this plan view schematic. The wooden dam was built of stacked hewn logs secured in place with lap joints to form a wedge-shaped profile. A, sec a section of the largest log was removed and submitted for tree ring dating, suggesting its construction around 1750. Dam breaching in Fiennesville, Pohatcong Township, and Warren County, New Jersey, required removal of the, an existing 1950s concrete dam, behind which a legacy wooden cribbing dam, a wooden sluice, retaining walls, and a much earlier 1750s dam were exposed. Tree ring dating of the cribbing dam indicates it was constructed in 1803 of logs fixed in place using lap joints. The space between the logs um, was rock, rock rubble filled uh, and the top of the dam was sheathed with milled wooden planks. Replacement of the Mosley Road Bridge over the north branch of the Raritan River in Mendham Township, Morris County, New Jersey, located next to a, a, to a former 18th century iron bloomery forge, exposed a series of horizontally laid, buried, parallel logs at the river level behind the existing 20th century concrete bridge abutments. The logs were documented and represent an early wooden ford crossing. Tree ring dating placed the logs felling date to 1729 or 1745. A large pair of 18th century four foot long iron bloomery forge togs, tongues were also found behind the existing bridge abutment. In 2015, Richard Grobin Associates excavated test pits for the Jersey Avenue pedestrian bridge in Jersey City, Hudson County, New Jersey. Excavations there in the creek floodplain exposed the remains of a deeply buried wooden plank road built between 1877 and 1883 using the Nicholson paving method. The boards were horizontally laid with their long edge oriented with the road access and were underpinned by thicker timbers laid perpendicular to the wood plank surface. Based on these and other examples, it was highly likely 
that the original uh, elements of the 1792 Stone Arch Bridge remained intact between the 1916 widening sections, which you can see here in this slide outlined in red. Documents indicate that the Stone Arch Bridge was commissioned in 1791 and constructed one year later, likely by local stonemason William Worth, and replaced an earlier bridge as one of several projects after the American Revolution as part of an infrastructure rebuilding effort. The triple arch design of the Stone Arch Bridge includes three barrel shaped arches with an additional tail race uh, arch at its southwest end. Bridge repairs took place in 1826 and in 1891. Later in 1896, the bridge's roadbed was raised with the installation of a macadam pavement and fill was introduced um, at the bridge's ends to achieve a gentler slope at its apex. In 1916, the bridge was widened by 10 feet. A 1935 HAB survey, shown here on this slide, reveals that within the bridge's arch, arch rings, two construction episodes were evident. Historic masonry arch bridges represent a close analogy for 18th century New Jersey masonry bridge design, as many of the settlers of the state traced their roots to and maintained ties with England. Documented 18th century English stone country bridges in rural locations like that of the Stone Arch Bridge in Princeton have a distinctive construction, construction style. The stone arches of these bridges were typically built of local schistos. The more regular stones were chosen to form the arch faces, while the more irregular stones were tightly fitted to make up the arch barrel with mortar poured in afterwards. The close fit of the stones with minimal mortar allowed the arch thrust to be transmitted through the stones rather than the mortar. As a result, the large forces at the context between stones ensured large enough friction forces to support each stone until decay affected the stone itself rather than the mortar lifespan. Notably, among documented country bridges in England, the spandrels of all these bridges were filled with gravel or earth. At the Stony Arch Bridge, um, the bridge deck and infill removal exposed 18th century bridge elements and later bridge modifications. Archaeological traces of several building episodes were evident. And here you can see um, some uh, cut water uh, that were pulled out from the bridge piers uh, during the 1916 um, uh, widening effort. So these would, have, these would have been initially facing the bottom of, of the piers uh, to break up ice that approached the bridge. In 1916, the bridge was widened and straightened. And you can see that widening effort outlined in red here. Um, a modification that is apparent in the form of two wedge-shaped concrete extensions one each on the north and south sides of the bridge. The widening effort resulted in a straightening of the initial S-shaped approach. During the widening effort, the original parapets were cut to the new bridge deck surface in the center of the bridge and the parapets near the bridge approaches were left intact. The new poured concrete widening sections were faced with red shale on the spandrels exterior and new parapets were constructed. Between the 1916 additions survived an, an almost fully intact 1792 Stone Arch Bridge. When constructed, the Stone Arch Bridge was designed with three main arches over the Stony Brook. A fourth smaller arch at the bridge's west end carried water for the worst mill tail race under the structure. The main arches were built as round barrel arches of mortared stone. The original mortared stone exterior spandrels were identified next to the interior side of the 1916 concrete expansion. These original spandrels were two and a half feet wide and 93 feet long. The exterior edges of each end arch were 77 and a half feet apart, exceeding the original bridge span by seven and a half feet. The 1792 exterior bridge width uh, was 21 and a half feet as planned in 1791, and the original bridge, bridge deck was slightly less than 18 feet wide. Traces of mortared stone uh, wing walls were identified at the southwest and northeast sections of the original bridge. 
while the historic documentation of country bridges, of country masonry bridges, had set ex expectations for dirt or gravel infill within this bridge itself, the internal structure proved much more complicated. Excavations between the 1792 exterior spandrels exposed a remarkable and unexpected structural bridge design, possibly the first of its kind and earliest documented in the United States. And here in this slide, you can see the 1916 uh, bridge widening, the original 1792 spandrels and parapets, partial parapet here, as well as internal spandrels and infilling between the center arch and uh, one of the end arches for the bridge. Rather than an homogeneous fill, internal mortared stone spandrels created longitudinal compartments or rooms housing compact stone rubble with little dirt. Here you can see three of these longitudinal rooms extending from the center uh, arch to one of the end arches for the, for the bridge. Uh, two parallel internal spandrels measuring two and a half feet wide, spaced between four and a half to five feet apart, and measuring about 60 feet long, spanned from the western to the eastern arch crowns. West of the western arch, a single internal spandrel existed measuring 20 feet long. East of the eastern arch were two roughly parallel spandrels uh, also measuring 20 feet in length. The internal spandrels were mortared and structurally tied into each of the barrel arches. Data gathered, gathered um, during archaeological monitoring informed digital 3D renders of the bridge design, which later, which, me, which better enabled documentation as well as il illustration of the internal configuration of the original bridge. And here you can see that 3D render. So this is what the bridge deck removed, um, and you can see the rock rubble and the uh, longitudinal room chambers. And uh, on the right side, you can see the bridge that des as designed with the rubble removed. And this is just another angle uh, where Smill is, is in the background. The identified engineering techniques associated with the 1792 Stone Arch Bridge uh, are the first of their kind archeologically documented and reported in New Jersey though the techniques do have antecedents in Europe. While not documented in English country bridges, one in 1740 Westminster Bridge designed by Charles Laboulet was constructed with semicircular barrel arches and a gridded pattern of longitudinal and transverse internal spandrels, which you can see these internal spandrels here in the design. Uh, internal spans, creating square chambers or cellular, cellular rooms that were filled with, with material. In Lablaise design, two internal walls parallel to the spandrels were intersected with perpendicular walls stretching between the spandrels, similar to a tic-tac-toe pattern. The nine compartments created by the dry laid walls were filled with stone to the road level. In 1740, the use of internal walls and compartments filled with stone in the construction of stone bridges was extremely unusual in London. Lablaise design was apparently used to some degree in other British build bridges. In the 1770s, the architect of Ireland's Gregnanamana Bridge uh, over the Barrow River incorporated semicircular arches and internal compartments filled with gravel into their design, likely directly influenced by their experience with or knowledge of Lavalais design. Princeton's Stone Arch Bridge reveals the technique made its way to America as well. Based on Lavalais design, a number of new engineering methods were introduced to the field of bridge building in the 18th century. Among these include ways of pile driving or centering each arch, use of semicircular rather than elliptical arches, the incorporation of secondary arches over a main row. Uh, of bottom arches, uh, which is similar to this design shown here, uh, and the use of reinforced solid interior piers. Rodok credits Labelle with introducing something absolutely new into British bridge building, that is, the direct use of science to decide questions about construction. 
Well, Belay was also opted uh, not to fill the area between the exterior spandrels with randomly laid rubble, dirt, or gravel. Princeton Stone Arch Bridge incorporates two of these important features. That is, semicircular barrel arches and internal spandrels. While the Stone Arch Bridge lacks secondary arches present in the Westminster Bridge, and our internal chamber, chambers have fewer partitions, so we just have longitudinal uh, rooms rather than a tic-tac-toe pattern. Nevertheless, its architects appear to have been influenced by Lavalais innovations, the science of bridge building, and were clearly demonstrating a level of worldliness and sophistication. This was definitely not your father's country bridge. The Stone Arch Bridge was meant to withstand the test of time, and stand it did. A recent study by Antonio Brancic and Camilla Cola of dissected 19th century masonry arch railway bridges in Italy reveals a similar use of internal spandrels, especially in bridge, bridges erected askew to water crossings. Their study indicates that this bridge element, coupled with hollowed piers and lighter infill, extended the viability of the bridges, uh, of the bridges despite increased speed and heavier loads over time. The technique, once familiar to 18th and 19th century masons, argue Branchich and Cola, were rapidly lost uh, with the abandonment of masonry arch bridges by the 20th century uh, for new steel structures. The study argues that internal spandrel walls containing light infill within the longitudinal chambers contribute to a bridge's structural performance and stiffening, help to avoid relative movement between arches, skewed um, to, the, to the water course, similar to the Princeton Bridge. They relieve load stresses on piers and bridge extrados, which are the exterior uh, curve of the, of the uh, arch ring, and reduces movements between arch rings. Internal spandrels also served a fundamental mechanical function and increased vault load carrying capacities. While in several uh, European examples, the infill is bonded, that is mortared, with the arch extrados, no such bonded infill was present in the Stony Arch Bridge. There, uh, the platy stone infill was dry laid in each longitudinal chamber, though care was taken by the masons to lay the stone infill in a way that maximized, excuse me, that minimized voids and maximized points of contact between stones. All of the spandrels, including both the internal spandrels and the exterior facing uh, of the 1792 bridge were mortared into the arch extrados and the top of each pier. Admittedly, few masonry bridges have actually been archaeologically recorded uh, during rehabilitation or replacement efforts in New Jersey. The Stone Arch Bridge in Princeton is amongst the earliest construction uh, in the region and is likely the earliest that has been archaeologically recorded. The documentation provided insight into contemporary bridge construction methods, which may be witnessed elsewhere at other slightly later masonry bridges in the area, such as the Broad Street Bridge uh, over the Assunpink Creek in Trenton and the Kingston Bridge in Kingston, New Jersey. Identification of the formerly hidden internal spandrels um, and internal design features provides significant insight into a likely critical component uh, an engineering technique associated with the Stony Arch Bridge survival for over 229 years. And I'd just like to thank everyone who was involved.